All right. Hello, everybody. Um, who wants to get up and do some jumping jacks with me? <laughs> no? No, no. Good choice. You didn't come to, a, to this conference to uh, exercise, did you? All right. So uh, my name is Matt Cole, and I work as a uh, senior integration engineer as part of PayPal's global professional services team. And uh, today I just want to give you a, a kind of a quick rundown of how we used to be monolithic in nature, um, how we're not anymore, and kind of a little bit of a journey of how we got there, right? So quick history lesson. Um, who knows what this is? Yeah? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, yeah. This, is, this particular one is a Palm 3. Um, it came out in 1998. Uh, and it was the, the first Palm device to feature an infrared port, which is going to be uh, relevant here in a second. But before I get into that, I, one of the interesting things that I found out while I was doing my research for this presentation is that you can actually buy these things brand new on Amazon. <laughs> it's like, OK. Eight, 86 bucks, OK. I mean, you could look at it. Like you're getting an 87% discount off a of list price if you, if you adjust for inflation. But here's the part that really got me. It's being fulfilled by Amazon, which means that there's some poor schmuck that is, that is paying Amazon to store this in their warehouse waiting for somebody to come along and buy it. Right? It's 2019. Who's, this, it's already a 20-year-old piece of technology. You'd have to be stupid to buy one of these brand new, right? Who thinks they can get PayPal working on this? Anybody? You? All right. Come on up and get it. If you can get PayPal working on that, I'll give you 100 bucks. <laughs> uh, so PayPal actually started off as a, uh, as a way to transfer money uh, between uh, people with Palm Pilots, right? It, Sorry, blank in here. Uh, and it, it wasn't until that service flopped that somebody went back and said, uh, oh, why don't we go and write a, a web-based front end for this, right? So now you don't have to have a, a Palm device to be able to send or receive money. And that service uh, launched in October of 1999. It took off like crazy. We already had 10,000 users by the end of the year. So this here is one of the earliest versions of the PayPal website. It, it dates back to January of 2000, uh, and it's being rendered by this uh, CGI binary called WebSker. And WebSker was a, was a monolithic program that we had. It was written in C++, uh, and it was responsible for handling all the interactions to the PayPal website. Right? Anytime you went to the PayPal website, whatever you were doing on there, the request was being handled by WebSker. Uh, in fact, uh, WebSker is still around to this day, 20 years later, it's still written in C++, and we still keep it around for compatibility with uh, some older stuff. So by 2004, this is, this is what our architecture looked like, right? And I picked 2004 because this is the, the oldest architecture diagram that anybody inside of PayPal knows about. Uh, so you can, you can tell that by this point we had something separated out. Um, we've got a total of 76 executables that are, that are running inside the PayPal environment at this point. So you've, you've, got, um, you know, you've got a service up there for processing credit card transactions. You've got another service for handling disputes. Um, you've got another uh, program that's uh, handling eBay transactions. Uh, and they're, they're all pretty monolithic in nature, right? And WebSker is still a, a part of this, right? WebSker is that big box up at the top. It's still handling pretty much all the traffic into PayPal.com. Um, but as, as time went on, uh, these monolithic applications weren't going to work for us quite as well. They were going to start uh, you know, causing us problems. Right? Uh, I would say 2007 is when things really started coming to a head. Right? Uh, we were doing these uh, releases about, uh, sorry, we were doing these major releases about once a month and uh, where we would deploy all of our applications at once. And it started to cause uh, issues for us. Right? I'm going to... I'm not going to dwell on, on any of these for too long, but essentially, you know, we were pushing these multi-gigabyte files to our machines over the same network that we were using to take production traffic. Right? We'd, uh, we had to do the releases during off-peak hours to, uh, you know, to reduce the impact on the business from our, from our US and European customers, which didn't work quite as well when we grew into a global company. Um, it required a lot of uh, support from our development and our QA engineering teams, because they had to uh, sit in a Skype chat room while the release was going on in case anything went wrong. 
Uh, these releases would start about four or five in the afternoon and go on for, for several hours until everything was done. So they'd, they'd start getting antsy and they'd be like, hey, you know, is, did, my code, code, did my code go out yet? Can I go home yet? Um, we had a hard time triaging bugs because we didn't really have uh, good monitoring in place at that time. Right? I remember hearing stories that uh, sometimes people had to uh, go into our production machines and attach a debugger to the process to figure out where, where crashes were happening. Uh, and it required a lot of uh, support from our tech support teams. So we knew that we needed to do better, but it, it wasn't quite that simple. Right? We, we had some obstacles that we had to overcome before we could, before we could really start moving away from this model. Right? And the first one is the way that we structured releases. Uh, it worked well when we only had a few applications that we had to deploy, but as time went on, we started uh, adding more and more applications to our network and things got a lot more complex. So we started uh, this concept of isolated releases. And with isolated releases, we would, we would go and figure out which applications we could deploy by themselves that wouldn't affect everything else. And these releases would happen more frequently. Uh, they would start earlier in the day, and uh, because they were smaller releases, they would get done sooner meaning that people could go home earlier, right? And it fostered this idea that if we, if we wrote smaller applications that only handle a few functions, we could get them deployed much more quickly. Um, the second was uh, the way we communicated between services internally. We used this scheme for, uh, called Cypro for making API calls between services. And the biggest problem that we had with Cypro is that we only ever had C++ bindings for it. Uh, so if, you're, if your application wanted to be able to talk to any other application inside of PayPal, it had to be written in C++. Well, so around uh, 2007, we came out with this uh, thing called uh, the Atlas Server Framework, or ASF. And ASF used XML contracts to communicate between services, right? And XML is pretty, pretty well understood in pretty much every programming language. So if, it meant that we could write bindings for ASF in whatever language we needed to, and it freed us from, uh, from being tied down as just a purely C++ shop. Uh, the third thing was this, uh, th this thing called PIMP. Uh, PIMP is an, actually an acronym that stands for Primary Interface to Most of PayPal. <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, and it was, it was the C++ class that contained uh, pretty much all of our business logic. Uh, but, and it dated back to the earliest days of PayPal, but it had become, a, by, by 2007, a ball of mud, right? So much so that uh, our, our documentation that talks about PIMP and the, and the history of PIMP uh, actually uses this graphic to refer to PIMP. <laughs> so by the time 2007 came around, uh, PIMP had grown to over 5,000 methods. Uh, it, was, it was huge, and you, know, you pretty much had to use PIMP in your, in your application but that means that you had to pull in PIMP and all of its dependencies into your application and it would grow the size of your executable unnecessarily and make it, make it huge, right? And God forbid that somebody did something that broke PIMP because if, if it did, it was gonna break your application as well. So we spent 2007 and, and uh, 2008 uh, breaking up all of, these, all of these methods, this ball of mud. Right? We went through every one of those 5,000 methods. We, we categorized them out into different categories and separated them out into their own classes. So now it was possible for, uh, for us to write applications that only imported as much business logic as they actually needed to be able to function. And it, and it set the stage for, uh, for taking these monolithic applications that we had and breaking them up into smaller ones that consumed fewer resources. And the last one that was really preventing us from uh, developing applications quickly and uh, you know, developing these, micro these microservices quickly is uh, PayPal and eBay uh, had a mandate against the use of open source code. Right? Like I remember when I, when I first started with PayPal in 2009, I actually had to sign something uh, saying that I agreed not to use any open source code in uh, my development work. And I, I don't know why that is. I think it was kind of over fear of how some of those open source licenses were structured at the time. But, um, it's a shame because the, the open source community was doing a lot of cool stuff. But as time went on, we, we finally started to realize the value of the contributions being made by the open source community, and we, we started to realize that, oh, hey, you know, we can develop things much more quickly and cheaply, right, if we reuse what's already out there. So by 2009 uh, is, is when things really started to take off, right? So we. Uh, we, we settled on using Dust for doing templates. 
right? Now, first, what we would do is we'd have a Java app that would handle the actual front-end logic, and then we'd pass the data from that into Dust to have, uh, to have Dust render the page. And finally, somebody said, well, gee, why do, why do we need to use uh, you know, Dust for everything, right? If you know, Dust runs on Node, why don't we just use Node for, for doing everything? Oops, sorry, I think I said that wrong. Um, but you get the idea. Why, why do we need to have a, you know, both Java and Node in there? Why can't we just use Node for everything? So after Node came along, we started developing this, uh, this framework for doing uh, front-end applications called Kraken. And we actually gave Kraken back to the open source community. And once Kraken came along, that quickly became the, the front-end framework of choice. Right? So now we had this framework in place that we could use for developing uh, microservices quickly. Uh, the next one, and this is, this is one of the big ones, is we introduced this uh, framework called Altus. And Altus was a big one because it provided developers with tools to, to create and manage their applications, uh, including letting them push their applications into production when they're ready. Right, so suddenly gone were these days when you had to wait for uh, one of these major releases or, or even an isolated release to push your application out. You could do it just on any random Tuesday. Um, and lastly, we started this program called PayPal as a Service, or PPAS for short. And PPAS came from this idea that you know, we could make things a lot easier on ourselves if we just used one common scheme for API calls, both internally and externally. Right, so instead of using uh, Cypro and ASF internally, and uh, we, we were exposing NVP and SOAP externally, right, we settled on just using REST for everything. And it made it a lot easier on us because now if we want to take an API that we have and make it available to the outside world, all we have to do is just add some metadata to our, our front end router that says, okay, here's the URL scheme for this application, and uh, here's the service that handles it, and that API is live to the world. Uh, in fact, one of the nice things about uh, PPAS is it requires developers to provide documentation on the APIs that they're publishing, right? I think uh, the, it requires uh, Swagger docs, right? Even if it's only for an internal facing API. And we have a site that goes and pulls in all that documentation and consumes it, so we end up with this nice directory of all the APIs that we have available both internally and externally. And it makes it so much easier for me to take that information and throw it into Postman, because now I've got this handy reference that says, you know, here's exactly what I need to be passing in, and here's exactly what I should be getting back. Right, so where are we today? Well, today we have 16 different functional areas of the company that are, uh, as of the time I wrote this, that uh, have published 710 APIs uh, in, into the PPAS program. Right, I'd say personally it's been a huge success. And we have over 2,500 microservices that are, that are running in our environment today. Um, I tried to, you remember that, uh, that chart from 2004 that I showed you earlier? Uh, here was my best attempt at, uh, at making a new one. Right. It's, it's kind of cramped, things are running together a little bit, but hopefully that gives you an idea of just how complex our system is today. So, I think it's, it's interesting to think about how we went about making this transition. Right, because I don't think we ever you know, made the decision that, oh, we need to become a microservices architecture. It just naturally came about as the most logical solution to the problems that we were having. So are we 100% microservices oriented? No. No, there's still some legacy code sitting around in our system, and it's probably going to stay there for the foreseeable future. But are we 98% of the way there? Yeah, I'd say we are. So with that, thank you for listening to me rant today. Thank <laughs> you.